there's more younger people wanting to take control of their drinking or stop drinking. So I've really noticed a, a shift. Mind you though, Gary, I have also seen a huge increase in uh, drinking in young people and a big increase in uh, during COVID, during this time, in people really developing. Yeah. yeah. That was going to be my next question. Um, I, I mean, I'll just share an experience here. Um, recently, I went to my local news agents, which also happens to be an off license here in the UK. And the guy who runs the place was absolutely stocking it. And I mean, overstocking it um, with cans of Carlsberg Special Brew and really strong vodka. And um, there were just like mountains of cans of lager and beer and cider and all this stuff and and i said to him i said i said this is more than you usually have and yeah. uh, and he said he said well well with with pubs being closed we've got more people coming in to buy drink and a lot of people are drinking very heavily um but i mean i i went out to get some cigarettes one morning at six o'clock and there was a guy buying vodka from from there you know at 6 a.m yeah um just this just this last week i can't i um, can't i can't uh judge him because god knows if i was on a bender i would drink in the morning so you know it's it's sad and it's and I'm sure you feel that sort of weird feeling of this out-of-body experience of looking at that and feeling so sorry for the individual. And yet you and I both experienced alcoholism very, very badly. You know, I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, it, it controlled huge aspects of our life. And we would have been in that news agent buying up alcohol. Um, every, you know, bringing the black plastic bag back. I remember I could only carry six cans of cider, you know, and you go back to another one because you don't want to go to the same one over and over again because you're I, embarrassed, yeah. you know, yeah. so you hit the other store. And then, I mean, it's just, it's it's this tragic, horrible circle of pain. And and once you get to that point um, and it's ruling your life, it, it, it feels, you feel so helpless. And it, it's just an awful feeling. And from from now standing on the other side of it, when you're mentioning, you know, the strong beers and the lagers, I almost feel sick to my stomach thinking about it. Whereas, you know, God, I was there, you know. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, your, your story in Journeys was quite touching, I thought. I, I quite liked it. So I would like to say to you, well done for that. Um, it it rung a lot of it. I mean, my story is different to your story. My my um, story with the Sinclair method, Claudia. But but you know, our drinking careers. I think we can both agree that that there's a lot of similarities there. And there was something which you actually say in in the chapter which you wrote. You you write about this lost decade which was your forties. Yeah. And what when I read that, I just thought straight away. I thought, oh my God, I know exactly how she feels because. Um, I mean, I I only went on to TSM when when I was actually forty, you see. Yeah. So I'd had the best part of twenty years of alcohol addiction prior to that. So I had some of my twenties, but I lost all of my thirties mm -hmm. to alcohol addiction, and I actually mourn it because. The yeah. third, because a person's thirties are supposed to be good years. They're supposed yeah. to be the years where you settle down and you get married and have kids. Yeah. And I missed all that. Gary, you, you, 
if I can teach you one thing, and I know that you, you know a lot of this, but I started getting bad when I was about 36. So from 36 to 43, when I found the Sinclair method, you think that a woman at 36, that, that I, and ironically, that was the year that my mother always said, my best year of my life was when I was 36. I would look fabulous, I was working, but always, that was this thing in my mind, like I'm supposed to really have my act together by 36 and, and it's my fabulous years. You know, you know who you are as a woman, mid thirties to early forties. I mean, that's like your power time. And that's when I suffered the most, 36 to 43, when I found TSM. What I found now, sitting here at 54, is my life began at 43. And yes, I had some, some, some bad times. But being on TSM was glorious when I complied. And then I had some bad times because I hadn't really worked on the emotional reasons why I drank. And since I've been abstinent for a year and a half, I've never been happier in my life. But all of the times that I would look back and go, oh, I lost that year. I have to tell myself this. I've gained so many years, good years, from getting the alcohol under control and then subsequently quitting drinking altogether. I have gained, my body's going to be healthier, my everything, my mind is gonna be sharper than if I would have just continued on that streak or I would have been dead. So we can't mourn, and I know it's normal to mourn for it, but every time you mourn for it, you have to, you have to really, you really have to say to yourself what you've gained from not only the experience, but also the process, but also where you stand today for the rest of your life. You're still young. People live easily to be 100 years old now. You would not have that opportunity for TSM if you would have continued to, to abuse it. So you would have lost your life. That's the way you have to look at it. You would have lost your life. You know, you could have stroked out. I could have stroked out. We could be, you know, incapacitated for the rest of our life. Then what? So when you mourn those years and you mourn all the settling down and all that stuff, listen, I probably think that my drinking contributed to my multiple miscarriages throughout my life. I'm, you know, probably, I don't know. Maybe it hurt my body. Certainly ruined a lot of relationships, but I, I can't live in the past. I can't continue to look back and say what was. I have to be very present and say right now, today, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. And that stands for something big. That's That means something, is that I could sit here happy and healthy now. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a very easy thing to get caught up in the lost years. I've written blogs about the lost years. It's, it's, a, it's a physical mourning, like you're mourning a death. It is so overwhelming because you feel guilty and shame and you feel like, oh, my God, the, my 30s, my, you know, I think the same thing. I was overweight from alcohol. I mean, I, I, I you know, I was chubby and I, I was, you know, that's probably why I didn't book jobs is because of my weight, because I had alcohol bloat. You know, I didn't and I and I sit there. Oh, my God, maybe I lost that film because of, you know, I didn't look fabulous. And it's, it's what am I going to do? It is what it is. And it, it, it now we are here. And, and you can't look back. you got to look forward, cliche as it sounds. <laughs> yeah, just about looking forward and looking backwards. I mean, look, both looking forwards and looking backwards, I give lip service to your internet movie database profile, and I mentioned The Hidden, and I mentioned Babylon 5, and all these wonderful films and TV shows and video games that you've contributed to over the years, as well as some pop songs, which um, <laughs> I, which I don't think like I've heard. Uh, apparently, there's a discography on on Wikipedia, but I I didn't actually look at that. I, um, I, but uh, but song. but you've been a very busy person. And I uh, and the question which I just have to ask is just on on the acting front, how are things at the moment? Because I mean, I looked at your profile and I noticed that that you've had a few things out this year. There's been a couple of video games which you've worked on, and I think there's been a couple of films as well. Well, a lot of the IMDb stuff is uh, films that were either filmed a long time ago or films that are in pre-production. Um, I definitely have not, uh, uh, I don't believe, I don't even know if I did 
And maybe I did an episode of 911 in January of this year before everything happened and closed down. But other than that, no, I've done uh, only video games. And the video games that um, I've only done one, in, I've done, I did some video games in, you know, outside of my home before COVID-19 struck and then everything shut down. And then since COVID, I've done one outside of my house where they had a, a sterilized studio that I went to. Um, and I was the only person working. Uh, and then I've done a couple of jobs from my house. I, I had to build a recording studio during this time so that my equipment was more up to par so that I could book jobs. Uh, as far as acting goes, um, uh, no. I mean, I, I had to add all sorts of source connect and, and get a better microphone and things, but acting you have to do in person and people aren't, uh, they're not even auditioning. We audition on tape and we send it in. Um, we, we have passed uh, some regulations where we could get back to work, but now that Los Angeles is going back sort of towards shutdown again, because the cases have uh, doubled um, overnight, literally, um, I don't believe that we're going to be able to do film and television production. We blew it. Our country is a mess, in case you haven't noticed. Um, we have uh, a, a really, really screwed up situation here, and we're heading towards a hundred thousand a day or something, according to <laughs> to Fauci. You know, yes, um, I've heard about this spike. Yeah. Yeah. Los Angeles and San Bernardino County is just there. Uh, it's a hotbed. I mean, I don't, I don't really go anywhere. I go to my, you know, if I have uh, just essential things, I go shopping, like marketing, and. Um, you know, maybe a, a, I have an eye appointment, you know, that, that I have to go to, um, which is your health. But that's it. Um, it. And yet there's a lot of people who aren't wearing masks and who are hanging out at bars. And it's just stupid. Or, or we have we have no cohesive plan because the states do their own regulation. And we have obviously an idiot in office as the president. So um, who doesn't wear a mask himself. So his supporters look at him and go, well, he's not wearing it, so I won't. It's just a cluster. Let's not get into politics. But it, America is um, not doing well right now. So the film and television industry, I very much doubt, is suddenly going to pop out back to life. You, how can you get 200 people on a set? And and the actors can wear masks, you know? So, I mean, everybody else can, but the actors can. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be another year, isn't it? before it's film and TV production really start up again. No, I don't I don't think we're going to wait until I don't think they'll wait until the vaccine to get films produced, but people will have to take tremendous. There's a whole list of, of laws that my union asked to pass for protection, for protective measures. And that includes a very limited amount of people on the set. That includes, um, you know, uh, taking co tests on the day of any physical interaction with an actor that people have to be tested. So the actor that you kiss or anything will have to be tested and yourself. So there's a there's a, a, a shed load of, of stuff that needs to be done in order to go back to production, but they're losing so much money but not being able to create content. They might take that opportunity and come back. They're, they're, it's in stages right now. The union is still dealing with producers. So, um, but I think they're, they're, they're very close to an agreement if, if if not even having reached an agreement. But um, my agents guesstimate maybe August they'll start coming back to life, like auditions and things, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, this has been a fantastic interview. Um, as I say, I haven't completed the book yet. I've, I've just read snatches of it. And, and this is actually what I really like about the anthology format with journeys the way how you can actually just dip in and dip yeah, out yeah. of different stories so if you're a little bit on the add side like i am you know um don't have a very good concentration span many times you can just sort of look at a story and just think oh that looks nice and short i think i've got the concentration span for that one so i'll read that one today and I'll read the longer one tomorrow. And and that's great. You know, I love, uh, I, as a reader, I love having that ability, yeah. that choice. So, um, two long stories, and that's you and Ben, but it was really difficult not 
I mean, we had to trim them a little bit, but we couldn't really trim them more because both of your writing styles are so fabulous. And I'm not just stroking you, I'm, it's the truth. <laughs> both incredibly good writers, so it was really difficult to to trim them down, but they're, they're, they're both such great stories and you're great storytellers. So we have two bookends of, of long stories and that's Gary and Ben, and then we have some that are a page or you know, a few paragraphs and some that are three pages or whatever. But I think altogether you're right. You can dip into that book and you can find a story that you relate to and then save it for later. It's, it's almost like one of those books you read before you go to bed. Just read a story or two and then put it by your bedside and, and eventually, because you're not gonna forget about the characters. It's, it's not like fiction. You get to read little segments. So it's good. I'm yeah. glad, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're reading it. It's it's strange. I mean, it was strange writing that book because it was it was during quite a haunting period. It was after my mum had died, I know. and it was something which I was able to throw myself into. So it was a little bit cathartic. I felt. But it's uh, reading it now, I'm not sure whether I would have written the same article. Um, you know, but but I think it I think it comes across all right. It comes off great. And I know you were going through a hard time and I remember us discussing the fact that you didn't you didn't relapse is just phenomenal. Um, you know, I, I lost my father April 24th this year and I dealt with it stone cold sober and it's a really good feeling. It's a good feeling to be able to process grief without drowning yourself in, 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 in a stomper like alcohol. So good on you for doing that and for, for getting through it without going back. Well, in any case, I want to thank you for your time, Claudia. My pleasure, Gary. It's great to see you again. Okay. And with that, we shall call it a goal.